Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining for another robotics seminar. Um, the last one before the Thanksgiving break. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, it's great to welcome Adriana Schultz, uh, who's coming all the way from Seattle. Um, Adriana is an assistant professor at the University of Washington, where she co-directs the Digital Fabrication Center. And uh, in her group, she builds um, next generation design tools for manufacturing and fabrication of physical artifacts. And um, she's also the director of the Women in Computer Graphics Research Program. And uh, in the before times, in 2018, uh, she got her PhD from MIT at ECS, where she worked closely with Wojciech and uh, Daniela. And I worked um, in many things, but the more, some of them um, having to do with um, interactive robogamy. Um, uh, she was recently selected as one of the top innovators under 35 by MIT Technology Review for her work on computational design and for developing, and I'm quoting, tools that let anyone design products without having to understand material science or engineering. I don't know if there's a material scientist in the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in any case, thank you very much, Adriana, for coming, for taking time to come back home to MIT and uh, for visit us at the robotics seminar. Um, we're eager to learn more about um, what have you been uh, up to. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for, for having me. It's, uh, it's really a great, great pleasure to be here, to come back home. Uh, and this is the first time I am giving a talk in person in two years. So this is really, really special. Um, and so I would love to make this a conversation uh, since we're here. and. It's live and it's in person. Uh, please interrupt me at any time with questions, with comments. I really, I really want to hear from you. Um, so today I'm going to talk about robotics for the next manufacturing revolution because this is the robotics seminar. But I want to start with a disclaimer. I'm not a roboticist. Okay. Um, but I do a lot of work that is interdisciplinary and has a lot of applications and collaborations with, ro with robotics. Um, and I want to tell you about it. So what is it that I do? Well, I work on computational design for what we're calling this next manufacturing revolution. So what do I mean by that? Well, most of the products in our everyday lives are still being manufactured in industries that kind of look like this, right? They're industries where there is automation, but this automation is restricted to short and very repetitive tasks. So we end up with long production lines that output products in mass. However, this is changing. And it's changing because we now have machines that can handle end-to-end -end manufacturing, like 3D printers. They can do things that are really versatile and end-to-end. -end. Flexible robotic systems, end-to-end -end knitting machines. All of these tools outline the potential for a big change on the products that we create. It's much more than increase of productivity. This is fundamentally changing what we can make and how we can make it. So what do I mean by how we can make? Think about a multi-material 3D printer, where you can specify the material properties at each individual part of your shape at an incredibly high resolution. What that means is that we can create objects that behave very different from anything we've ever managed to create in the past. We can embed electronics in soft sheets. We can have new sensors right, in textiles. So this is a much larger freedom a form, a freedom of what we can design. And I think this is really exciting. But it's not just about what we can make. It's about how we make it. So if you look at the new devices for digital manufacturing, well, that's exactly what they are. They're digital. What it means is they have these programmable abstractions. That is, the same machine can create a variety of different objects by changing the code. And I think this is really exciting because it allows this versatility, right? It allows batches of one production. So I envision a world, right, where because of these new uh, machines, we can, each and every one of us, have very complex, right, and one of a kind, highly functional objects created for us on demand. And my work is building the computational tools that will get us there. So why does it matter for robotics? Well, I want to argue in this talk two things. 
first, I want to try to convince you that these computational fabrication, uh, these changes in computational fabrication can change how we think of and how we build robots. And then I want to tell you about some uh, challenges and uh, computational fabrication and how robotics can help push forward this revolution. So let's start with robot design. Um, let me just do one quick thing. Right. Okay. So let's start with robotics with the new manufacturing tools. So first, as I said, there's a lot of novel capabilities, right? So he, these are examples of soft robots, right? Uh, mechanical computing, embedded sensors, all of these new capabilities that we are able to do because of the novel manufacturing. But as I said, it's not just about the novel capabilities, it's also about the novel workflows, right? When we design a robot, we typically need to think about the hardware and the software. And we think that the hardware, right, is usually bulky and this one big thing that we create once, right? But the software is easy to vary, right? We can customize the software after the fact. Well, with these batches of one machines, right, it turns out that now the hardware can be varied as well. And because of this, there's been a new push of thinking, well, when I want to design a robot for a specific task, I don't necessarily want to use an existing robot and customize the software. I can design the hardware as well. So in our group, we've been doing, so this is some of, of the RoboGummy work. We've done this work, we started doing this work on co-design for ground robots. So we want to concurrently design both the geometry and the gates of these robots. We create robots by mixing and matching parts from a database to create the, the, the shapes. And then you can also select a set of gates uh, that are suggested and compose them for this robot. The system automatically uh, computes uh, the metrics of how uh, the robot is performing. And if you have a specific uh, objective, it will also guide, um, show you how you should manipulate and change this robot to achieve uh, that specific objective. And you can also you know, run an optimization for that objective and get the resulting robot, which is a fab complete fabrication plan. So this is about designing objects that can be directly fabricated. The output of the system is a plan for a robot that is foldable and is uh, 3D printed, the electronics that you need to purchase, and also the software that you'll load directly into your microcontroller. So the robot behaves as uh, simulated in the system. And some examples of robots that we have designed and built with this tool. And of course, these are cute little toys, but you can also make you know, larger versions of it and embed them in sensors, have them uh, navigate an obstacle course. We've done some uh, follow-up work here, collaborators also at MIT, um, on creating uh, computational design of, of drones. So here we're also co-optimizing, but we're co-optimizing the geometry uh, of the drones and also the controllers. Here is examples of, of results from, from that work, where we, by this co-optimization, we can uh, get a result that has a 33% increase in, in the payload capacity. And this is because the co-optimization actually tells you that you can do a change in the shape here so that now this propeller that before was not really being used can now be used. And then more recently, um, we had follow-up work with designing hybrid UAVs that mix propellers and fixed wings. And of course, this is just some of the work that I've been involved with, but there's a, a, this is a really nice direction of research in concurrent design of controls um, and geometry. But I want to argue that, you know, the slide is really cool, but it feels kind of wrong, <laughs> right? Because, um, yeah, you know, control is easy to vary, and now geometry is easier to vary, but it's easier, right? It's, Still not that easy. Uh, hardware is still something that is expensive to do and change. So one of the things that we've been investigating more recently is, well, let's try to think of ways that we can customize the hardware, but maybe hybridly combine those with things that are off the shelf. So when we think of concurrent design for geometry and controls, right, we can think, well, on the one hand, I can have an off the shelf, um, 
robotic arm, I'm optimizing the control for the different uh, manipulation tasks, or I can concurrently optimize the shape of the robot and the trajectory. Or you can do something hybrid. You can take a commercial off-the-shelf um, arm, but then combine it with a customized end effector. So this is an example of what we've been doing. We are concurrently optimizing the end effector um, and the trajectory so that we can pick and place um, different types of objects. And we can do cool things like you know, an objects that have uh, internal geometry that you can go in and you can uh, figure out that you have to do like a screw motion to pick it up and a specific type of shape that can exactly like grab this, this, uh, this object through this uh, joint optimization. So I think this is a really kind of interesting direction to think about, right? Like this for, for, for co-optimization, how can we also leverage parts that, that already exist? Um, so as I said, so we have you know, novel computational tools can, can change the way that we think of how we build robots, the types of robots that we build or how we build them. Uh, but on the other hand, I think there are all also a lot of interesting open problems uh, that robotics can help solve in computational fabrication. In particular, if you go back <laughs> to this slide, right, we said, well, you know, Hardware is easy to vary, but it's really not that easy. And it can be made easier. Um, and I think there's really important advances in, uh, particularly in mobile robots, um, that can make this happen. So one of the things that I think is really challenging with fabrication um, is that a lot of our tools, right, they are um, they're static, right? Um, and that means that there's a fixed scale, right? Like he's a 3D printer, there's a fixed print volume. Um, they're linear, right? You can't uh, parallelize it really well, um, and it's in a fixed location. For, for example, if you want to use robots to create buildings and things like that, you want to have robots that can go into specific job sites, right? Um, and particularly in depending on, you know, if you want to um, afterwards have to uh, transport uh, objects later on, right? Just having the robots there, building makes it a lot easier. These are parallelizable, they're flexible. Uh, so we've been doing some work also in building these kinds of mobile robots for fabrication. So this is some of our, our past work in creating um, teams of robot carpenters that can you know, take pieces of lumber, chop them, and then some of our most, and then of course you can assemble this later on, some of our more recent work in creating designing robotic jigsaws where you're combining different functionality of creating the holes and then uh, the cutting tools so you can create this uh, non-holomorphic, um, uh, use these non-holomorphic tools, but do that uh, uh, flexibly, just you know, bring those objects to a job site. And of course, there's, I think, a lot of uh, interesting directions there. So hopefully, in this first part of my talk, I have convinced you that uh, computational fabrication is really cool. There are really interesting open problems in the space, and it really matters for robotics, and they're really fun and cool problems to solve. So now I want to spend the rest of this time telling you how to do it. Um, before I go on, I'm wondering if there are any comments or questions or it's a good time. Yes, please. Maybe a bit of a simplistic one, but you were mentioning uh, you optimize the geometry for certain goals within the uh, code development software. What kind of goals generally do you put? Is it like a performance metrics or? Yeah, it's a performance like? metric. So you have some goal or some, for example, for the drones, it was you know how much payload capacity or energy consumption, or for the the, ro the, the ground robots, is following a given trajectory or things like that. Yes, always optimizing for a given performance metric. Or for the grasping, right? It's like uh, not colliding, no self collisions, right? With the the shape and the and like being able to take the load and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about that right now. It says so. Thanks for the question because that's exactly my next slide. Uh, <laughs> so how do we design things, right? So how do we solve these problems? Well, how do we do computational design? Typically, um, we have some performance goal, right? Uh, that we want to achieve. So how do we do that? So imagine that you have a robot that you want to create, right? You need to specify, as we said, the geometry, the controls, 
um, like the electronics, the software, right? All of these specifications define a high dimensional design space. Okay? So what it means to design? Well, design means to pick a point in that space, right? But how do you pick that point? Well, you pick this point based on what you want this robot to do. How do you want this robot to behave like once it's part of the physical world? So is this robot going to walk? And if so, how fast does it walk? How stably does it walk? Or how does this robot react to an external force? Or you know, cost, how much money I need to spend if I'm going to build that robot, right? So to answer your question, this defines a set of performance metrics or a performance space. Right? So design and under this abstraction means to select points in this space, right, based on how it maps, right, to the performance space. Or it means to solve an inverse problem, like given some idea of what you want to achieve, right, how do you find a design that achieves that goal, right? And solving these types of inverse problems is really hard, right, for many reasons, right? First, like the design space is usually very, very large, right, hard to represent. Okay. Uh, the metrics that you care about are also challenging to measure, right? And then, of course, there's, there's a whole search. Okay. So how do we go about doing that? Well, there are a few steps. So the first thing that we typically do is we try to find a good way to represent this design space with a nice, reduced, and compact representation right? that makes it easier to search. The next thing that we have to do is to find good ways to measure the performance. Right? with efficient algorithms. And then finally, we need to search. Um, so I want to spend the rest of this talk telling you about some ideas that we've been investigating in these um, three uh, areas. So let's start with reduced representations. So first, I want to say that good representations are typically problem specific, right? If you understand something about your problem, something about the geometry of your problem, about the physics of your problem, you can usually do really well about creating right, the right representations. And this happens a lot in our field in computer graphics, right? Like you want to represent this shape as a voxel grid, you want to think about it as a mesh, you want to think about it as a point cloud, science distance, whoops, science distance fields, right? Um, and different problems, right? Different representations are going to be better for different problems. So that's true, and it's really important. But that said, I want to argue that there's this one representation that I think is really cool, and that we should think about it a little bit more, or spend more time thinking about it. And that is programs. Okay. So when we design models, for many years, for decades, right, we've been designing models, like since the first you know, computer, like Sketchpad, right, we design as programs. Right? If you look at how we build geometry right, as a sequence of operations that construct the solids or procedural modeling or even you know, diagrams that you do in LaTeX, right, these are all programs right, that tell you how to build a shape. In fact, if you look around you, right, almost every fabricated object that you have in this room started its life in a CAD program. Right? So CAD systems are the ones that are used for creating almost everything that we fabricate. And these are programs, sequence of instructions that tell you how to build these shapes. And the sequence of operations are also parametrized, so we can afterwards go and think, oh, well, I'm going to change up, which is maybe the radius of this fillet, right? And now I can create variations of this model as well. So it's a nice, it's a compact representation, it's a, compact, it's a representation that exposes variability, which is uh, uh, a changes that you might want to further optimize. Um, and they lend themselves really well uh, to also uh, ex exploration and optimization. In particular, I think it's, this was one of the first works where we um, was also um, with collaborators here, uh, where we started thinking about using program synthesis, right, to reverse engineer design. So we think about designs as a program, so can we use program synthesis to basically synthesize a program, right, that is similar to this input? And of course, if you think about robotics, right, once the designs are programs, you know, the software is programs already, right? Uh, so I think this is a really nice unified representation to think about design and modeling, which is programs. 
And I'll talk more about uh, uses of this. Um, the second idea that I think we should think, use more <laughs> when we think about uh, design representation. Uh, any thoughts? It's fabrication. <laughs> it's the fabrication process itself. Um, so I want to argue that the way we build models, right, the tools that we use to build a model tells us a lot about the kind of shapes that we create. right? They, they, in fact, they, they literally define and constrain the space of what you can make. right? Um, and if we understand this, right, it can tell us a lot about the kinds of things that we can design. So this is a, a recent project where what we did is we to, you know, you walk into a room and you find a design that you like and you take a few photos and voila, here's a fabrication plan for, uh, that exactly reconstructs this model. So it's really like a nice computer vision problem, but the way that we do this is because we know that this is a model, right, that was a carpenter model. Right? And by understanding fabrication, we can not only have a really good exact reconstruction, but we can actually tell you, okay, this is a design that you can then modify, that you can fabricate, right, and instructions for how to do it. So I want to use this as a motivation to tell you, well, you know, it's, if you understand fabrication, right, you understand a lot about design. And it's something that we should take into account when we're thinking about reduced representations. And there's one more cool thing. Fabrication plans are also programs, right? That's what they are. A sequence of instructions that tell you exactly how to build this, uh, this model, like take a piece of wood, put it on a track saw, chop it up, right? So I think this is really cool. In fact, it's really cool because if fabrication is a program and design is a program, then what does it mean to generate fabrication instructions? given a design? Well, it's a compiler. Right? And because it's a compiler, you can actually use some really cool techniques in programming languages to make this process super efficient. Um, so this is a recent project that, that um, we have in collaborators at, at the University of Washington. And what we've been doing is understanding fabrication and defining hardware abstraction languages so that we can do this kind of compilation. And we've been using this idea for program optimization, which is the idea of program rewrites. So for an intuition, since I'm assuming I don't have a, like PL people in this audience, um, the intuition is this. Like, you know when you have like, I don't know, Mathematica, MATLAB, and you type in an equation and you click the button simplify, right? And it goes from here to there. What it's doing is it's saying, well, this is a program and that is a program. I want to find another program that is equivalent, semantically equivalent, right? But I want to update the syntax right, so that it's shorter. And I do this by looking at different rules where I can do these rewrites. In this case, it's like commutative, associativity, and so on. And I do these rewrites right, to find another program that is optimal. And the way that this is done is they have this really cool representation, which is called e-graphs or equivalence graphs. And the idea here is that I want to have a compact way of representing what equivalent programs look like. And by doing that, I can then find the program that is equivalent, but is better for some way. In this case here, it's shorter, right? But in our case, it's the program that is the optimal fabrication type, or the optimal fabrication error, or the optimal material cost, right? Um, so this is an area that I am super, super excited about, um, thinking about developing hardware abstraction languages for fabrication. I think this is something, right, like instruction set architectures revolutionized computer science uh, many decades ago by creating this layer like of understanding software and hardware, right, allowing us to make progress both in the software and hardware domains. Um, and I think something like that, you know, is asking to happen in the fabrication domain. So I'm, I'm super excited about these ideas. Um, OK, so again, I'm not saying that these are the representations for absolutely everything. Looking at problem specific uh, representations is still really interesting. But I would encourage you to think about programs and fabrication if you're looking at good reduced representations.
OK. So now we know how to represent our space. The next question is, okay, how do we measure performance? So you have your design, maybe a CAD model, and you want to evaluate how it's going to behave like once it's part of the physical world. And that can be, you know, can take a lot of time, can be computationally pretty expensive. But then you want to use that feedback to go back and update your model, right? And you want to do this again and again and again. Um, so you want to have a way to do this efficiently. What we want is that this performance evaluation, well, of course, you need it to be accurate. But you also want it to be fast. And importantly, you want it to be differentiable, right? Because if it's differentiable, then I don't have to be like sampling the domain multiple times. I can just say, hey, take a gradient <laughs> based optimizer, right? And find me the optimal design. So differentiable simulation is a really exciting area. And there's a lot of people in this room working on this and doing really cool stuff. <laughs> um, and I think this is, this is really, really interesting. And these, uh, these methods are both looking at uh, understanding the physical models right, and also learning uh, to make it really efficient to create uh, evaluations of performance that are differentiable. One of the things that we have been uh, exploring in this domain is uh, how can you do this for CAD? So as I mentioned, I think that thinking about representation is really important. In fact, uh, program representations and program-based designs are really a great way to have generality, right, of the kinds of things that we can build. But these kinds of representations don't lend themselves really well <laughs> to this kind of differentiability. And let me show you as an example. So this is a really, really simple model, right, designed in CAD. And the, we were talking about this earlier, right, the promise of parametric CAD, right, is that I can say, well, look, um, I want to make this a little bit thicker, so I'm going to like change this height and this distance here, and voila, it works, right? But it works because I know this program really well, and I tweak these things together in a really nice and efficient way. Because if I had gone there and just said, let me change this height of the chamfer, I would get this model that is completely meaningless. And even worse, if I had just changed this height of the box, then I would get an error. What this is telling me is that I cannot execute a certain function. And then the functions after that don't execute because they refer to things that happened in the past, and they're no longer there, and I'm completely at a loss. Right? Um, so we've been doing some uh, work now of trying to understand like, how can we create CAD languages that are differentiable by modeling what these references should look like right? and creating ways that, like, given a geometry and features of this geometry, I can compute the program, the parts of uh, uh, an algorithm, the program that will, that's generating uh, that piece of geometry and actually differentiate uh, the program with, res like with res the parameters of the program, this geometry with respect to the parameters of the program, sorry. Um, and this is super cool because now I can go and say, well, if I want to change this model, right, I'll go and, and edit this for a little bit. I can now figure out what is the program that would give me this edit by doing an optimization because I have a differentiable code. And voila, here are some examples of how you can change this model but preserve the structure. This model doesn't break. And uh, it's optimizing based on some other you know, kinds of geometric e uh, energies here. Here's an, so here's a, an example of this um, uh, the system. So you can go in. You want to change. You, you, say, you say how you want it to change, and then uh, it optimizes for you using these uh, differentiable programs. All right. So we talked about having reduced representations. We talked about ways to measure uh, how they perform. And now let's talk about search. How do you do search? Well, you could tell me that, well, you know, I have a really nice reduced representation, right? I already got there. And I know how to compute the performance efficiently. It's even differentiable, right? What is left to do? Throw it into your favorite optimizer, right? And my students love to do that, right? Get an LOP and like try every single one or just go to LBF, whatever, right? Just throw this into your basically gradient descent optimizer and you're done, right? 
And in many cases, you are. But I think there are really interesting aspects of particularly design uh, optimization that make search methods a little bit more tricky than just you know, gradient descent. Um, and I think these are interesting areas to explore. And there are two things that I think is interesting about this kind of problem. Well, there's more than two, but I'm only going to talk about two today. Um, here are the two. Um, the first search challenge is that typically you have more than one objective. Right? So you have, again, this is a design of that camera mount, but now I added a bunch of holes right? so that I can eat. So I have a parametric model with the size and shapes of these holes. Right? And this defines a nice design space. And I'm trying to minimize that weight. Right? But of course, this is a camera mount. So when I put the camera on top, I want to make sure that this object doesn't you know, deform with the weight of the camera. So now I have this other metric. Right? And these metrics are typically conflicting. Right? Because if I take you know, two models here in my design space, right, one of them will, be, uh, will deform less, but it will be heavier. Right? And the other one will be lighter, but also will deform more. So in fact, we don't have one optimal solution. We have a landscape of optimal solutions that we want to find. So it's not really just a single objective optimization. You have to find these multiple, uh, uh, m multiple solutions right? that is this landscape of trade-offs that you can create. This is called the Pareto frontier. So this is one of the challenges, right? your optimization. It's multi-objective. The second challenge is that these optimizations are multi-level. And what do I mean by that? Um, so imagine, again, that you want to design your ground robot. right? You need to design the geometry, and you have the space of shapes. Right? And you want to design the gate, and you have your space of gates. Right? So it's a really large space, because you need to search both in the shapes and the gates. So you can say, OK, I'm going to define this joint space right, of the shapes and the gates. And fine, it's large. But it's OK, it's a big space, and I'm just going to go and search it. Well, why can't you just do that? What's wrong with this? What's wrong with this is that the this, this space of gates, <laughs> like, what is that? Right? Um, and it doesn't really exist because the space of gates is different for different topologies. Right? So I have this robot, and I can say, OK, like for this specific instance of the shape space, I can tell you what the gate space looks like. Right? These are the different gates that I can get for this robot. But the gate space is not defined right, in this upper level problem. And, and this is what I mean by multi-level. You have these nested loops. You have an inner loop inside an outer loop. And necessarily, you have that. right? Um, and the reason why you have that is, is this, is that because the constraint space, the space that you search is non-defined in the outer loop. Okay? So this is, this is the reason why it's tricky. It's not because there are two domains right? and it's large. It's because necessarily they are nested. Right? This idea of this, the constraint region is undefined. Um, so I think that these are really cool problems to, to think more about. Right? First, this idea of how do you deal when things are multiple objectives and when they are uh, multi-level. And I'll show you some directions um, that we've been investigating in this area. So first, some work that we've been doing uh, with um, multi-objective optimization. So one of the challenges with multi-objective optimization is that, well, it takes a really long time to find an optimal point. right? And when you have multiple objectives that are conflicting, you don't want to find one point. You want to find a bunch of points. right? to describe this landscape. So this is a lot more costly. But we make this, and there's been a lot of work on trying to figure out like, how do you get a bunch of points and like, optimally distribute them on this frontier. But we made this cool observation. We said, you know what? Yeah, it's super hard to get to a point there. But once you get to a point, and it's like, you know, I'm here. I found a cool point. Why well, didn't just like? Hang out there for a little longer, you know? Kind of look around, see where you're at, right? And that's this idea of, well, you know, I got here. Let me see what else is optimal close to where I am. 
So we call this the, a local expansion, and we do this using duality theory for multi-objective optimization, figuring out like what does it mean to stay in the parade of front? We derive this formula that tells you, well, if you go in this direction, you stay in the parade of front, at least locally. Right? And this allows us to, instead of finding a bunch of points, we find these local manifolds, right? the old dimensional manifolds that represent this space and this mapping that then we can get back from uh, design space. So now we represent these objects you know, with these manifolds. And here's some example of now you can navigate the performance uh, by exploring like these. Uh, so here you're navigating different trade-offs and you have you know, real-time feedback on what is the design that achieves you know, those, uh, those trade-offs. And it's kind of interesting. You can also look at what happens along like, these, these boundaries. right? You have two designs that are very different from each other, uh, but they perform the same, actually. This is, this is funny, like when, when I saw this, I thought, oh my god, I have a bug. <laughs> and then I realized that actually there's, there's like physical reasons why these models actually behave the same. It's like, no, oh, this is why this is useful. I'm learning about my, my, my design problem like by, by looking at this. It was just like, no, it, it was actually working. Um, and more recently, we've been uh, expanding these, uh, these ideas uh, to uh, handle multiple contexts. So here the idea is that it, you have a few objectives that you really want to optimize, but then uh, there are other uh, parameters uh, that are varying. Uh, for example, in this uh, wind turbine, uh, there is a different wind speed. So you want to understand what is optimal, right? considering that your object can be placed in different contexts. So we're also looking at algorithms to do these expansions when you have objectives that you want to optimize, but then other objectives that you want to explore the diversity across it. Um, so how do you do this, um, this kind of looking around when, when you have these kinds of um, uh, scenarios? So let me tell you a little bit about multi-level problems um, and ways to, to address it. So I'm going to show you two different case studies. I think this is a, a really exciting area that, that requires further investigation. Um, one example here of a multi-level problem that we've worked on was the idea of finding CAD models to match a given query. So I have a database of CAD models right, that are parametric, right? They have the parameters of the CAD program that can change. And I want to find the model that is the closest as possible to this query. Why is this a bi-level problem? Well, it's because I want to find the match of what shape it is, but also how to tweak the parameters, right? So um, and this is a motivating example. Like if you look at these two models, you might think that the shape on the left uh, is the closest one, right? Uh, but if you understand how the parameters can vary, then you notice that, in fact, the shape of the right is the most similar. So. This is a bi-level problem. Usually, you have to go and look at every single shape in your collection. Right? The inner loop is fitting the parameters to your query shape. And then the outer loop is finding the best match. So one way to address this kind of bi-level problem is to say, well, maybe we can create a joint embedding. So here, uh, we say, well, this is a retrieval problem. right? We can create a descriptor for the space where every single model is a point in this descriptor space, and I can find the closest thing to the query once I have this embedding by doing a nearest neighbor search. And this is cool because now, well, what happens if I have a parametric shape? Well, if a, if a, if a, if a shape is a point in descriptor space, a parametric model is going to be a manifold, like a low dimensional manifold embedded in this descriptor space. And they can have different dimensionalities, and they will have, right? Because these different models have different number of parameters, they vary in different ways, but that's fine. It doesn't matter, right? Because it can still project them into that space and then do a nearest neighbor search. So this is a really nice way to handle uh, a, a bi-level problem. And you show here that you know these are some examples of retrieval, how we are comparing um, on the bottom, like our method to you know, not uh, just finding a fixed mean shape that is not really also optimizing for the parameters. And it's actually interesting in this case, you know, we don't even find the right object from the same uh, category. But if we can uh, do this uh, bi-level search, uh, we're able to find the result. And more, in, more recently, we've been extending these ideas to bi-level prog problems when we have programmer presentations, laterally. 
Um, so here's a, an example. This is a, a follow-up work on that Carpentry compiler that I showed. And what we've been doing here is, well, before we had this compiler, right, that given a shape, right, could optimize for the fabrication plan. So these fabrication plans, as I mentioned before, they are programs, right? And this is also multi-objective, so I have, you know, my Pareto frontier of the different trade-offs of programs for this specific design. And I do this uh, with this program optimizers that I mentioned before, these equality graphs. But what happens if now I want to consider changing the shape as well? So I could also change this design to be a little bit different. So you notice here this chair is, has some difference in the way that the joints are created. Right? And by doing this variation, I can actually get designs that, or fabrication plans that outperform right, what I could do with the original design. Right? But again, this is a bi-level problem because now I need to, the, the types of fabrication plans that we can generate for any design is completely different, right? The space that you can search is really different. So you need to necessarily have these nested loops, which is very challenging particularly because everything here is discrete, right? But we go back to this idea that you know, fabrication plans are programs and trying to use these ideas from programming languages that say, well, you know, these are all different programs right, that I need to search. But if you notice, there are some similarities along these programs. There are similarities between parts that are shared across programs and even within the same program. right? And these similarities are really useful uh, when we try to treat uh, when, uh, these uh, equality graphs or these ways to represent equivalent programs. So equality graphs, as I was kind of hinting to before, uh, I'm not going to go into the details. I'm happy to spend hours talking about them offline if anyone is interested in any graphs. Um, but uh, the key idea here is that you have these designs, right? They, they have something in common that they share. And this e-graph is representing all of the different programs that you can cr create with this, uh, for fabricating these geometries. But the point is that there's a lot of similarities and they're only represented once. And this is a compact representation. And what we did here is we explored this, the, the fact that you could do that at multiple levels of your optimization. So we can represent this compactly. Um, and this is some result of you know, this bi-level optimization with, with e-graphs so we can even for complex models, right, we can find uh, designs that outperform uh, an original design in terms of optimizing for fabrication. OK. So this um, kind of sums up this idea of you know, creating reduced representations, measuring performance, having good ways to search. One thing I want to mention is that of course, right, uh, we can't expect to be able to do design completely offline, right? Um, design is iterative by nature, and there are many reasons for that. And there are many reasons why we do want to keep users in the loop. Um, and we do want to have designers giving you hints. And we want the computer often to give ideas and suggestions of where to go next, right? But really keep the experts in the loop, so allowing them to explore that space. Um, so when we think about search, I think it's also important to think about ways that we can interact with the users. And I don't have a lot of time to describe some of our efforts in that space, but I just want to mention that one of the things that we've been doing, uh, particularly with, with CAD, is having ways to give suggestions to the users right? Uh, by learning from, what, from databases of user designs. So in the past, we did a little bit of work of learning from databases of assembly. So here's an example where we're trying to assemble this model. The user mixes and matches parts from a collection. And we automatically infer how to snap them into place, what connectors to put in. So then the output of the system is actually a model that can be directly fabricated. It has like all the, you know, the corner brackets, the screws, and everything like that. Uh, and it outputs you know, a bill of materials that the user can then go, and you know, it's fabricable. Um, and this is a data-driven model, so of course, like you know, the same thing that learns you know how to put together cabinets, you know, can put together you know tie rods and these connecting planks with these these bolts, right? To, for example, design a go kart. More recently, we've been extending these ideas uh, to more generic uh, assembly problems 
related to CAD. <laughs> um, so we have this really nice database of, of CAD assemblies, right? And so when we create designs, we talked about creating programs and you have these parts, right? But once you have the parts, right? CAD models are not these simple parts. They're actually complex assemblies of parts and how they interact with each other, right? There's exact placements of where they are composed and the motions uh, for, uh, for these assemblies as well. Um, so we gathered this really nice database of like 90,000 assemblies and they have, so mates are these, the ways that these uh, assemblies are joints. And we have, you know, a lot of them, like 500,000 ones. Um, and we are trying to learn how to create these uh, mates. So a really important problem in, in CAD modeling because if you have, for example, these two objects that you're trying to mate, this is an example of you know, the user having to specify like, exactly where the mates are. Um, and in fact, CAD, it takes, and this is you know, from our collaborators in industry, takes about one third of the modeling time to actually do the assembly process. Um, so we've you know, gathered this database and have you know, new representations for, the, for CAD structures that we, we're using a, a graph neural network. Um, and we did this thing, which is, we call it, really like the name, it's automate. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you want to um, mate to two parts, it will give you, uh, wait, did I, where's the, you select uh, the two parts and it will give you, you know, suggestions of where these things can be placed and what is the type of connection that you can have. Okay, so um, I think that that just about sums up my talk. Um, and I have this vision of, you know, new manufacturing revolution allowing each and every one of us to have our personalized, customized, highly efficient, and one of a kind products created for us on demand. And I'm very excited about the computational challenges that will lead us there. Um, and I would you know, encourage you to, to think more about these processes and how they can also uh, impact uh, your work in, in robotics. And I would uh, love to chat more about any of these topics today or, or in the future. So thanks so much. Any questions? I thank you for the great talk. Um, so I, I think you you stated this pretty well, but people under underappreciate how uh, um, important constraints are when you design stuff. Like a rookie mistake is you know you put a hole, you got to assemble to screw it in, but you didn't leave like the free space, and that's a really nasty constraint. So your feasible set is like super um, topologically disconnected and weird, and you know it's so under um, during your search procedure, how does your search um, algorithm um, respect these kind of constraints, especially with gradient-based solvers. That's right. Um, so you mean, so well, there are different types of constraints, right? Um, so when we're, uh, what we're doing with CAD is to try to express, so in CAD, typically, like for example, when you design a sketch, right, that's what you do. You specify, well, this has to be parallel to this, and you have all of these sets of constraints, right? And as you said, um, as you change the topology, right, these constraints completely change, right? Um, and there are uh, important discontinuities there, right? Um, so it's almost as if, um, it's, it's a really great question, and happy to chat more online, offline because it, <laughs> you nearly nailed it. So, so basically what happens is that it's almost as if you had two functions. Right? Like, so it's not just that it's discontinuous, it's like it's a completely different function with completely different variables when I change from one topology to another because I change the constraints, right? So it's like if I, in one configuration, I have, a, say, a fillet here, right? And the other configuration, the fillet has disappeared. And because the fillet has disappeared, now the constraints are completely different because I don't have constraints with that fillet anymore. It doesn't exist, right? Um, yeah, so. So uh, what, what we are, we've been doing is thinking about, you know, using formal methods to get understand how these representations are changing, right? And then use automatic differentiation. So you have basically an expression that tells you with ifs, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's, it's a really interesting problem. I guess, thank you. Yeah, so thanks for the talk. A follow-up mm -hmm. question on like constraints. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So how do you in I mean in both the gradient descent example and the compiler uh, take into consideration the constraints from tools? Let's say we have a lathe and a three-axis mill, and now there are certain shapes that I cannot make with these tools. Uh, so how do you consider those constraints in the uh, in the optimization? That that's a really good good uh, good point. So. Um, not claiming to have solved all of the problems. Um, I think there's there's really room for understanding. For example, for example, even things that we've been looking at but we haven't really solved. Is, for example, when you want to design something that can assemble, you need to make sure that you can actually insert things or that you can fit a tool in there and so on and so forth. So we haven't dealt uh, with these assembly constraints yet. For the specific question about the tools, um, in the Carpentry compiler, we have a domain specific language for the design and the fabrication. And our DSL is like, it's CAD-ish, but it's not really CAD. Um, it's a subtract, it, it, also, it also understands that you're building this out of wood. So the idea is that you have paths of, it's subtractive basically. So it's almost like, think about subtractive CAD. Instead of extrusions, what you have is pieces and ways that you can cut, right? And then you have these tool paths. And then uh, our compiler basically knows for each of the tool of the paths, what are the tools that that can be used to cut that path? Does that make sense? So, like for example, if it's curved, right, I cannot use a table saw, right? I need to use a jigsaw, that kind of thing. Um, and then it does the optimization based on okay for every path, right? There's this mapping of like what are the tools that I can use, and then I'm gonna pick the optimal one. Thanks. Hi, so I have a question about um, like this in this optimization procedure, it seems like you have some sets of variables that are like continuous and you can kind of do gradient descent, some that are discrete, but you can maybe still optimize in an integer way, like a number of holes in something. And then others that are like discrete in some other way, like do I use a quadcopter or do I use a plane for this task? Like yeah. completely different. <laughs> How do you handle switching between those in like a search and optimization framework? I mean, that's that's a great question, and it's, <laughs> and I don't think I have a good a good way to do this, right? Mix discrete continuous optimization is is really hard, and um, it's one of the reasons why a lot of the problems end up being bi level, right? Is because you have these kind of discrete things, and then you have these continuous methods. So I, I, I don't claim to have a you know, that you know. How do you call it? Something like a silver bullet? Is that a thing? That like just solves every problem that has this, this kind of makes this creep continuous. It's definitely something that we have been investigating. Um, but I do think that understanding these ideas of like, what is a problem that is by level? What actually means, right? Or like, when can you create this kind of dual embeddings or you know these joint representations, and when you cannot, right? I think it's really important to try to start addressing some of some of these problems. So, yeah. And as a follow-up, is there a role for like the user in guiding the search between those? Because obviously you don't want to query hmm. the user on like every possible number of holes. You don't want to ask them about that, but maybe at a higher level and using that as a heuristic. That's right. I think that's a that's a really good point. I think some of my past work was definitely done with that, like the Robogami, for example, right? The discrete part was like the user decides how to mix and match, and then we, everything that we optimized was the continuous aspect. So there's definitely room, I think, I think for that, right? Um, but then I, I think that, you know, uh, there are different ways of engaging the, the user, and um, sometimes it's, it's the right thing to do to like let them do the things that is easier for them but hard for you. But I think some of these mixed discrete continuous problems are things that there, there are good solutions out there. Of even, for example, um, figuring out good ways to when you're doing this do this discrete search, but figure out good ways of inferring like where you don't want to go, right, and just like just not going there really quickly. Um, I think that those are directions that are that are really good to, to deal with these kinds of mixed discrete continuous problems. All right, thank you. Approximations, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, thanks. Um, I th one thing with the co-design uh, is very often, or everything I've seen is try to optimize for some kind of cost function that's task related, mm -hmm. and this is then you end up with a mechanical design that relies on being able to also implement an optimal controller, which I think is sometimes actually really difficult to do in practice. Uh. Uh, I was wondering if you've thought about also like doing designs where it's actually easier to implement the controller. Interesting. Um, I haven't, but I, 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 I think that's a, that's a really interesting point. I think um, this is an area that I, I don't have any work on, but 
I've been have like dreams of working on, uh, which is this kind of idea that like you don't really need like you have ob performance metrics that you care about, but you don't really need the thing to be optimal, right? Yeah. In all of these metrics, like you want to optimize over it, but if it's just a little bit like you no. Know, heavier, but then it's easier to do something else, right? Like for example, like the controller becomes easier. Like what I've, I haven't looked at it in terms of like an easier controller, but definitely for example, like it's more appealing or faster to fabricate or easier in a different way or more, or, or more understandable, right? Uh, this, is, this is definitely of interesting. So kind of like an optimization, but you know, you don't really need to like get there. You just want it to be within a range, right? Um, I think this is this is really really interesting, and it hinges on that question of like, do you really understand the performance metrics that you care about to begin with? And I think the multi-objective optimization is one way of saying, well, you know, maybe you can just do that. You can say, well, okay, simplicity of the controller versus, you know, uh, you know, how how well it achieves the task, and then you can you know figure out like where you want to be in that Pareto frontier. But even that is assuming that you actually know what metrics you care about, and all the times you don't, which is why design is iterative by nature, right? So learning. Right, to infer right what is it that the user wants, I think is a really exciting area of research. Thanks. Yes, thank you for your great talk. Also, related to what you have just answered. Mm -hmm. So, when doing the design, you essentially have this forward model where the inputs are the parameter of the CAD models of the programs, and the output will be your metrics. Mm -hmm. So, forward model can be a physics based model and can also be a data driven model, as we have said at the end of your talk, like for example, graph neural networks. Mm -hmm. So, under which scenario do we want to choose one over the other? Or, like, can you comment down what are the pros and cons of different like, model choices? Oh, that's that's a question I ask everybody. <laughs> Just like, when do you, when like, especially when you do the search, right? Like, this, like, what are the right ways to combine? If I understand your question, like, you're like, when do you, when do you use physics, or when do you use, you know, numerical methods versus when do you use, you know, your your learned um, solutions, and what's the right way to combine them? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I uh, tip like for. I, I, I think most of the um, the time is really like task specific, right? Depending on the task you want, you understand your task, and it gives you the right way to combine these techniques. Um, that's what I'm mostly I've done in the past, and what I've seen done. Um, I don't know if there is, you know, the optimal way of, of combining these things. Um, does anybody have? I mean, I asked this. I I asked you that question. The other day, <laughs> um, I don't think I think you said the same thing. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Thank you. If you figure it out, let me know. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, there you go. I had a question about. Um, first of all, thank you for the great talk. Um, <laughs> Second of all, I had a question about the parametric manifolds uh, mm. in the lower dimensional space. Yeah. Um, how do you measure how, like, in the end you showed objects that looked really similar to each other. How mm -hmm. do you measure that similarity? Is it just, like, distance in this embedding? And is that always qualitatively similar to what, like, you think of as being similar? It depends on, uh, it, so yes and no. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yes. I measure it by distance in this embedding. Is it always good? No, it depends on how you pick the embedding, mm. right? Um, and of course, like different descriptors are going to behave better. And of course, like that's where you can use learning. Like you learn good descriptors for your problem, it, it usually behaves better. And so, how? What are the ways that, like, so far that you've looked at in terms of like getting those embeddings? Like, just examples of things that you've done. Um, I mean, there's there's really like in this case it was shape similarity, right? So there's really tons of literature um, on that, um, on different ways to create shape descriptors and retrievals, and different ways to to learn them as well. Um, um, so yeah, you can. Uh, but I but if your question is also like how do you do you would you generalize them to other problems, right? That is not you know just shape. Um, I think it's uh, it's interesting. It's, it, it, it is a hard question. I, I was talking to some some collaborators in industry that are trying to apply this to uh, these kinds of techniques for similarities in in CAD. Um, and I think it's the, the hardest question is what is the space that you use for embedding? And it's it's really hard. And, and I really do think that the best way to do is learn them. 
Cool. Thank you. <laughs> okay. One more question. Maybe ending on potentially a less interesting question on this front, but I'm I'm so curious what drove you towards considering sort of a carpentry approach uh, in selecting the tools and the and the um, fabrication methodology for this sort of rather than when you started out sort of looking at the 3D printing, which I guess when I think about intuitively, I think about when you're trying to do this optimized design, 3D right. printing seems like the low hanging fruit, I guess. Right. I mean, I think the reason why I like carpentry, and you can tell I do a lot of carpentry. Um, is um, I think it, it has, it's, it's like the right level of complexity. Like the 3D printer is great, but it has too much freedom, right? It's really like the best representation for a 3D printer, for most 3D printers, well, I'm gonna take it back. But a, a good representation uh, is just voxels, right? Um, um, right, they can just tell you like you actually can create. Um, and then there are other uh, tools that I find that are a little bit too complex, right? Like if you're going to do electronics all of a sudden, right? Um, carpentry, I think, is kind of this intermediate step where you still have to do all of these, like you have a lot of tools. Um, and I think that this is one of the exciting parts is that when you have to decide how to make things, it's also about planning which tools you're going to use at each time, how to basically the scheduling part doesn't exist in a 3D printer. Um, and I think carpentry is kind of like the, least complex thing that still has all of the interesting problems, which is why I picked it. <laughs> in, in that process of codifying carpentry, um, have you encountered a situation where through the experience of codifying it, you, you, you said, oh, I wish I had this tool that doesn't exist? Yeah, I mean, it's why we did the robotic jigsaw. <laughs> But um, uh, I, I, I think that that is, I, th I think that, yeah, I think, think that's, that's one, it was one of the inspirations of, of this work for, for sure. Um, one of the things that is challenging with carpentry is because you always have to move things around, right? And like as in this example, like, you know, you wanted to use a jigsaw, but then you have to like, you know, go in and first do the holes and then bring it to something else, right? Uh, so these kinds of hybrid uh, ro robots. Uh, and I think there's, there's more in this area too, so. Cool. That's a good question. Any other questions? Looks like. We're done. So thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. <laughs>